Kia ora katoa, katoa. I am Sapia Shuk, Executive Officer at Risk New Zealand, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our April 2020 lunchtime seminar. These are truly extraordinary times that we are living through. I hope all of you and your families are doing well and keeping safe in your respective bubbles. In light of the national lockdown, we have shifted our very popular lunchtime seminars entirely to webinar mode. And I thank you all for joining us today from the safety of your homes. Our lunchtime seminars run on the first Tuesday of most months, and they remain one of New Zealand's most popular events. Today's seminar will be our first one for 2020. I would like to thank and acknowledge the support of Risk New Zealand's partners who make this possible. Our premier partner, Marsh, our brand new crisis management partner, F24, our key lunchtime seminar partners, SAI Global and Safety Associates, and our lunchtime seminar supporters, which are our venues across the country, KPMG, Watercare, Navigators, Christchurch City Council, and Power Co. Today's Risk New Zealand lunchtime seminar is being delivered only as a webinar. I'd like to especially thank our speaker for today, Steve Macron from Cornwall Strategic for inviting us into his home for this seminar. But some would say that all of this uncertainty is par for the course for Steve. Steve's experience in bomb disposal in the New Zealand Army gave him a good understanding and a personal appreciation for decision-making under conditions of stress and uncertainty. Recognizing that traditional risk management theory is of limited use in fast changing and highly complex environments, Steve has dedicated his career to seeking, to seeking out and developing solutions for this issue. He has continued to build on his understanding of complexity theory, Kinevin, and its application to real world problems. He was able to ground his theoretical knowledge through working with large corporations and government organizations as they face uncertain terms. Steve also teaches complexity management at the University of Auckland's Business School. Steve, today, Steve will introduce the concept of managing complexity, especially in light of the evolving COVID-19 crisis, and give us some tools and techniques to respond to emerging risks. He will also discuss how some of the big force proposed responses to business continuity are the consulting equivalent of panic buying toilet paper. All participants are on mute for the webinar, but please feel free to type your questions directly into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screens at any time during the session. Steve will answer your questions at the end of his presentation. If you are joining us via a telephone and not on a computer, then unfortunately you won't be able to ask a question during the seminar. You can send any questions later to admin officer at risknz.org.nz and we'll endeavor to have them answered by Steve at the earliest. Without further ado then, over to you, Steve. I'm gonna just hand over in a minute. We're all ears. Thanks, Sakia. Uh, kia ora, everybody. Welcome to a small corner uh, of the spare room of my home. Uh, these are indeed unusual times. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, risk and uncertainty, and we'll look at it through the lens of uh, COVID-19 and potential, I guess, set of responses we can take uh, as a risk management group in respect to moving forward from that. Um, so I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Steve McCrone. Uh, I run a small consultancy, uh, 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 hence I reserve the right to take a, a shot at the larger consultancies. Um, I'm much nicer in person than I am um, when I'm talking. What we're going to do is I'm going to create a straw man of uh, risk management and then we're going to look at that through the lens of uh, COVID-19 and we're going to think about how we move forward in a pragmatic way when really we don't know what the future is going to be like. So um, one of the things that um, uh, we're tempted to do in times like this is try and predict um, how things are going to turn out in the future. Um, people talk about the new normal, people talk about um, what's changed or what's changing. And I think there's going to be um, a lot of change and most of that is things that we just simply can't foresee. 
I'm going to use as a framework um, the Kinevin framework, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. -E um, you can Google that. I imagine a few of you are probably doing or have done that uh, recently. And what we do with the Kinevin framework is we use it to contextualize um, the situation before we act in it. And in my view, at the moment, then I think um, if we spend some time contextualizing our situation before we then go and do stuff, we'll actually be acting in a far more uh, pragmatic and um, I guess valuable way. So I'll just I'll just start with um, Kinevin. I'll describe it, and then we'll talk about it in terms of risk. And please feel free to answer any questions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I do a um, a two day course purely on the Kinevin model, but uh, we won't have time for that today. So it's spelt uh, Kinevin, C Y N E F I N. Uh, it's a Welsh word. It means it's got the top of that. Um, uh, a place of multiple belonging, similar to the concept of Tūranga Wai Wai in Māori, is a, is a place of your kind of um, uh, connection with uh, land or, or sort of spiritual place. And it looks like this, should always be drawn uh, freehand, I'll draw a nice big bold letters. We've gone old school on the whiteboard here, um, I hope you can see that. And what it, what it looks at is, is uh, the context of a strategic situation. So some contexts are very clear. Excuse my handwriting. And things that are clear means that there's a direct and obvious relationship between cause and effect. So a good example is if you walk into a McDonald's and order a Big Mac, it should be very clear to you what you're going to get as a result of that interaction. It should be clear to the person who's making that burger what to do in respect to um, your request. Okay, so um, the founder of um, uh, Cognitive Edge is our business partner, the developer of Kinevin, Dave Snowden. He talks about how to act when things are clear, um, and that is to, and I won't write it out in full, sense, categorize, respond. So you say, what's happening? What category or rule should I follow? And then what am I going to do in respect to that? As we move up here, we get more and more factors involved and it's no longer clear to us how they interact. And we call these complicated. And when things are complicated, then we still know that there's a relationship between cause and effect, but it might not be uh, clear or obvious to us. So what we do in generally in complicated situations is we look for some kind of analysis or some kind of expert uh, advice. Um, if uh, the engine in your car breaks down, most of us aren't uh, uh, mechanics, so we ring someone from say the AA, or we take it up to the local garage, and that person diagnoses the system and can then uh, um, act in order to improve the system. Okay, so in respect to the motor vehicle, uh, the mechanic might see it as clear, because their context is different to ours, we see it is very, very complicated. So now we're starting to see that different situations might be clear to some people and incredibly complicated to others. And that's um, when we go and we get uh, expert advice or we start to do some analysis. Okay, and Dave calls that um, sense, analyze, respond. And the difference between categorization and analysis is analysis takes time and resources Analysis will give us a set of options, and, and, and as risk managers, maybe then we can start to think about those options in terms of their risk, or their cost, or their resource constraints. And then we choose the option that's best for us. If our situation changes, then through our analysis, we can uh, find another option or find another way forward. As we move this way in Kinevin, we get to uh, situations that are complex. And in complexity, like complicated, there might be multiple factors involved, but oftentimes we don't know how many, and the relationship between those factors is certainly not clear to us, and we can't really work it out through analysis. What we get is a situation like uh, if you've ever been invited to a party and you ask yourself, should I go or will I have a good time? Okay, you might have uh, lots of information about that party, where it is, who else is invited, whether or not there's a theme, whether or not the bar's free or you've got to pay for your drinks, 
um, what sort of food there might be, you know, what have other parties like this generally been like, but it's not enough information to let you know whether or not you're going to have a good time. Um, hopefully, a few months ago, most of us got invited when we were allowed out to a Christmas party, and you, and you say to yourself, you know, how do you have a good time at a party? Well, you go in, uh, you mingle, you talk to people that um, you may have not talked to before, and your interaction with the people changes their experience, and their interaction with you will change your experience, hopefully for the better. But for those of us who have been to multiple parties, I grew up in Invercargill, that's not always the case. Some parties might uh, uh, devolve into a drunken brawl, others might end up having a really, really good time. So what we see in complex systems that we don't see in complicated is this idea of emergence. It's non-linear and it's constantly fluid. Okay, so here, when we talk about actions uh, in the complex, we talk about probe, sense, respond. And a probe is a small action designed to understand the disposition or understand the, um, the way the system works. So if you come back to a business sense, then a probe might be uh, releasing a prototype just to see how the market reacts. If they react well, we might launch into a, a full-scale um, product development. If they react poorly, we might um, shelve it, or we might learn from that and use that information to develop our next product. As we move back down this way, we're getting into good old fashioned chaos. In chaos, there's no discernible link between cause and effect, or we don't have the computational ability to detect it. Okay, so in chaos, effectively anything can happen and our ability to control the outcome is very, very limited. A lot of people talk about this COVID-19 situation as chaotic. I, I tend to disagree and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But in chaos, really our choices are do nothing and suffer the consequences, good or bad, or take a big action in order to survive the situation. So most of you will have um, smoke alarms in your house. If a smoke alarm come, uh, goes off in the middle of the night, then your big action is to uh, alert the other members of your family and then leave the house. So the idea of get out, stay out is a heuristic that allows us to survive the potential chaos of a fire. So in chaos, similar to complex, we act, sense, respond. And what I've done here is I've underlined the operative words in each of the uh, domains, where here it's the categorization that matters, here it's the analysis that matters, here the probe matters, or the small experiment to find out the disposition of the system, and here the action matters. You'll either survive it or you won't, this, we're taking action to survive, and complex, we're taking action to understand, okay? Because you, you can get it wrong. If your first interaction at the party's not good, you're talking to someone who's boring, or someone who um, clearly hasn't got much in common, or someone who's starting to get aggressive, or someone who's starting to get amorous, you might actually move on and talk to someone else. And we've all been in a situation where we've had to kind of rescue a friend from a uh, um, conversation at a party, okay? so. This uh, uh, framework gives us the contextual understanding of a situation, but it also gives us a guidance in how to act. Now, this part in the middle, the fifth domain of Kinevin, uh, we used to call it disorder, but actually we can now call it confused. And when you're in a confused state, then generally you don't have enough information to be able to contextualize uh, your position in, in respect to the strategic environment. So a lot of people have been talking about uh, COVID-19 particularly as either a very complex or a chaotic situation. Um, if you really think about it, actually this lockdown position that we're all in at the moment is actually a very stable and clear position. Okay, there are some very clear guidelines, rules, and in fact laws um, around how we can act in lockdown. Okay. Um, if you treat COVID-19 as a medical issue, then it's becoming increasingly complicated. Um, some would argue complex, but what we have in the, in the, in the medical sense is we now have um, some information, some data, and some medical expertise that allows us to um, act accordingly. And we know, for instance, that we're gonna need respirators if we have a certain number of cases in hospital. We know 
that certain um, ways of preventing COVID-19, such as hand washing, are better than others. Okay, we've got lots of options, um, but actually now we're starting to get um, some really good, um, clear medical advice on how to deal with the patients, how the disease is spread, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the complex parts of COVID-19 are um, situations such as how a business is going to respond, how and when a market's going to come back online, um, how and when are people going to react to um, having spent four weeks doing Zoom conferences, and then uh, how will that impact their desire now to go and fly, um, like I used to regularly do, go and fly to Wellington for a meeting that might last two hours. My desire to do that might actually change as a, uh, an emergent quality of doing this today. Okay, and then of course, uh, in some situations, we can treat um, the COVID-19 response as chaotic. If we were unfortunately in one of the jurisdictions where um, the medical systems become overwhelmed and we have to start triaging or we have to start making big decisions about who we treat or big decisions about um, moving away from the crisis, then we are in fact in chaos. So from a risk management perspective, we can think about context uh, in the following way. When things are clear, then what we can do is have very, very clear response. So if a situation uh, uh, determines that we need a rule, then we can put a hard and fast rule in here. And a good example uh, for risk management might be a, um, a, a financial threshold. I can't spend more than X many dollars as a manager until I seek permission from um, uh, up the food chain. Okay, and these are quite um, rigid, so you're either following the rule or you're not. As we move up to the complicated, then this is, of course, the domain of experts. And from a risk management perspective, if we treat risk as identifying, evaluating, and prioritizing the effect of uncertainty, then actually that starts to sound like a very complicated analytical process. And a lot of the risk management models that I see don't actually get outside the complicated domain. But in times where we can actually determine the outcome that we want and we know our starting position, then this is the appropriate way to, to manage risk, is to identify, evaluate, prioritize. Okay, um, and what you end up with is a whole lot of, um, you know, like kind of, um, you know, risk matrix kind of idea or a Gaussian risk model, um, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, and then what we can do is then prioritize our resources and evaluate the situation and, and then we can have options on what we're going to do in terms of managing uh, risks. So um, if you've got say a, a hospital and you know how many beds you've got, how many patients are going to come in and the types of um, ailments that they have, then you can take a very um, complicated risk modeling approach to managing that situation. One of the fundamental issues I have <laughs> with uh, risk management is generally when uh, we manage risk in respect to complicated, then it's the analysis that gets privileged over uh, actions or probes, which as I said is okay when you know what the future is going to be like, but it will actually constrain you when you don't know what the future is going to be like. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to explain risk management in respect to uh, strategy and then strategy in respect to how we move through uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 situation. So I'll just rub this out, I can redraw it or send you some notes. Okay, and now we'll talk about risk or strategy in the complicated. Maybe not too high up the board. Okay, and um, if you think about, let's give you the quick 101 on strategy. In the complicated, we have change and we have time. And what we do with uh, business strategies is certainly the sort of traditional approach, is we look at our current state, or the current situation that we're in, and we say, uh, let's actually spend some time you know, categorically stating where we are. Most businesses can do that because they've got management information systems that support this type of thinking. And then what we do is we say in, in T plus three, zero, 
where do we want to be? And generally, this is kind of a better place. And we can spend a lot of time on this idea of um, goal setting or um, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals, um, uh, vision statements, etc. And then the role of strategy is to link the future state with the present state in a way where people understand how to apply resources over time. We can have these uh, check-in points. And then what we do uh, oftentimes is we then go to the risk management profession and we say, okay, let's, I mean, obviously you guys have input into the strategy, but when we think about risk management, we say, how do we manage the risks from moving from here to here? And we'll do things like we'll put in some, some milestones or some check-ins or some review points that allow us to then say, once we're here, is this where we're expecting to be at this point of time? What's our resource utilization like? Are we on track in terms of time? Okay, and that's generally the kind of shape that strategy takes. And then the role of the risk management profession is to manage the risks to this particular um, path. Now, one of the, one of the things that um, this type of strategy has at its core is the big assumption that the future, so we time here, is either known or knowable. So it's either complicated or clear, and if we don't want to go back to Kinevan. And as we can see with um, uh, COVID-19, or if those of you have had experience with the Christchurch earthquakes, or um, if we can remember you know, the GFC, which doesn't seem that long ago now, um, oftentimes, what we get out of the strategic environment is a big uh, non-linear shock to the system, okay, which then pushes us temporarily into what we think of as chaos, although I would count it that it's um, more confused. Um, and then we recast our strategy and look for what um, people often describe as the new normal. Okay, so we go through a phase of change. It's, it's oftentimes not as good as we thought. Uh, uh, and then we try and plan our way out by establishing this new normal and saying, okay, let's, let's recast our strategy through this period. Okay, so in my view, oftentimes the future is not known or knowable to the point where we can plan in that kind of detailed way and to a point where the effort we put into risk management on this plan is actually worthwhile. Um, things are more complex um, and non-linear than some of these complicated, or most of these complicated methods uh, can deal with. And what I've seen since, because obviously I've been looking and I've had people sending me stuff from all over the place, is a lot of consultancies and advisors are effectively saying, you've been knocked off your strategic direction, let us help you build a new one, okay? So if we use the same method that disrupted us uh, two weeks ago to construct our way forward, then we're actually becoming uh, systemically uh, unable to counter major shock. So when we talk about moving forward, then we really challenge this assumption of a known or knowable future. So building a better algorithm is not the way to move through this or a more detailed plan, okay? And I call uh, rather unkindly, quite deliberately, the merchants of certainty are the ones that are saying at the moment, okay, let's recast your strategy or let's um, look at the situation in, in, in those linear terms, okay? So what we talk about um, in terms of uh, strategy is, this idea that there's a big unknown here. We don't really know, particularly now, how the future is going to shape up. In fact, is we don't really know how our near-term future is going to shape up. Most of the time, we can take that for granted. We can extrapolate our current position into the future three, six, 12 months reasonably easily. Right now, there's a lot of organizations, and I guess some of them are listening to this podcast, that can't do this. So our methodology is, uh, uh, colloquially we call it what to do when you don't know what to do. Okay, and this is it. So first of all, um, we disperse ourselves of the uh, idea that the future is known or knowable. We 
now act here. And the first thing that we do in terms of business is um, what I call defending the um, break-even point. And I guess most organizations have, have already done that. If you haven't by now, then you're probably in a lot of trouble. And that is understand your cash flow, protect your um, revenue as much as you, can, as you can, and lower your cost base as much as you can. And that can be very, very painful. Um, what we see is the government trying to support organizations through that period. Um, but by and large, we need some kind of financial platform in order to move forward. The second part of this is actually to say, you have the best strategy in the world. You can get the best strategy consultant in the world to come up and help you with this uh, way forward, but your team need to be resilient. If we haven't got personal resilience, i.e. our ability to confront and deal with, um, we don't have to like it, but we have to be able to manage and move in very, very difficult circumstances. And again, um, there are lots of people who are in that position, you know, particularly those who are on the front line, um, you know, um, people who have recently lost their jobs, people who really don't know um, and what the future looks like. That can be quite unsettling for a lot of people. So making sure we've got uh, resilience at a personal level is really, really important. You can't move forward without it. The second part of that is leadership. Um, our idea of leading uh, an organizational leading change uh, has to change. And I'll talk about that last, but resilience and leadership are effectively the cornerstones of moving forward. If you haven't got those things, then you need to get them. You need to, to find a way to um, set that kind of that base. And then we can start thinking about strategy. And the more uncertainty we face, the effectively the shorter our strategic horizon. It doesn't mean that we can't have an aspirational goal. I call this a shared understanding of success. But the more uncertainty we face in the near term, the more ambiguous this needs to be. Because if it's too um, detailed or too specific, then we will almost certainly not achieve it. We can't set really detailed, specific future goals if we really don't know what the future is going to be like. Okay? So, um, a shared understanding of success might be um, we want to be the number one consultancy in New Zealand or we want to um, be, we want to sell more um, uh, uh, Pinot Gris than anybody else in the country or something like that. It can be very um, aspirational but the direction of travel or how you get there might not be or it shouldn't be clear. Then what we do is we say look at our feet. What is it about my situation right now that's actually working or has traction or has a, a light or an idea or a hypothesis or a way of moving forward? Okay, and then we take a small step. Uh, if the situation is extremely uncertain, just make your steps smaller, right? So then rather than developing a new product right now, we might develop a variation of an existing product. Rather than launching an entirely new service, we might bring a service and, and launch it digitally. Um, rather than launching a product with 15 features, let's find three and see if we can make it work. Rather than trying to launch into a new market, what about we just try and um, get some momentum in a market that we already or used to service two weeks ago? Okay. If we take multiple small steps as an organization, then some of them will fail and some of them will succeed. What we do is we're thinking big. Okay, acting small and moving fast. And they're the three things that I believe will keep an organization moving forward. As long as we're moving in generally the right direction, we're taking small enough steps that we can actually manage them within the resource constraints and within the um, conditions that we're under with the COVID-19, particularly during lockdown. And we're moving fast, i.e. we're not stagnating or waiting. Waiting is failure when we're getting into complex um, domain. Then we can take, we can see some success and we can see some failure. What we do when we see success is we amplify it. When we see failure, we learn from it. Okay. And then we take another time step. Where are we now? How can I move forward from this position? And what we start to see is through a succession of um, uh, small failures, or I call them safe to fail experiments, the path or the strategic direction is actually starting to emerge as a consequence of action. 
It's not something that we need to plan in its entirety from start to finish because it will almost certainly be wrong. And we'll almost certainly be forced to go back and recast and rethink. And the rigidity that this puts on our business means that next time there's a shock, we get knocked off our strategic um, direction. Our plan is now fundamentally broken or, 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 or useless. You know, we might have spent a uh, hundred grand developing this really cool strategy last year. This year, I can tell you now, it's not worth a thing. There might be parts of it that are, but use those parts to develop your next small step. And then we'll see the emergence of your new strategic direction or your new opportunities through this idea of learning from failure and managing movement. So as we move forward through this um, COVID-19 uh, 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 period, then this is the time to actually empower your people to take small steps and experiment and learn, share that knowledge, share that understanding, and then the organization can then start to gather momentum and the direction of travel, as long as it's generally okay, we'll see the emergence of new opportunities, the emergence of new interactions, uh, the emergence of new ways to create value. We've moved away from this idea of designing and now we're prompting this uh, strategic environment for opportunities to grow and thrive. And from a resilience or a personal um, perspective, back at the work face, then if you're taking small steps, learning and moving, then that'll be far more rewarding for you as an individual, uh, for your team and um, your organization in general. Okay, I'm just gonna check <laughs> the time. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to Kinevan now and just show you what that looks like from a strategic perspective. So what we've done okay, is we're confused at the moment. So we're pushing up into complex and taking lots of small steps. And these are things we can manage, things we can do right now. So I call this tomorrow, the tomorrow morning test. Your way forward should start tomorrow morning. So on the back of my office, I've got a board that has a list of small steps that me and the team are taking to move forward. Some of them will be successful, some of them won't. We are learning as we move forward. And as we start to get knowledge, so this is starting to work, this uh, area of the um, business or the strategic environment is starting to respond well to the types of things that we're doing. This area isn't. We're starting to gain knowledge and understanding, okay? We're allowing for small failures that effectively insulate us from these big systemic failures. The organization is becoming more adaptive um, and the organization, through its ability to tolerate small failures, is becoming more resilient, okay? This is a natural systems approach to strategy rather than a mechanical approach that we might see in the complicated. Again, the merchants of certainty will talk about this and then try and drag us here as quickly as we can. So as soon as we see something that may or might work, let's go and wrap a whole lot of resources around it and turn it into a business plan. Okay, if we do that, then we miss the opportunity to experiment and explore. So my advice would be actually hold your organization or your staff, excuse me, in this area here, for as long as you can. So embrace the uncertainty of the situation for as long as you can, because if your options are as broad as possible for as long as possible, then your ability to see opportunities and see new ways of working um, will, be, will be wider, okay? And then you can uh, lean into them. As we start to see stability here, then we can move across and fully develop new products, services, ways of working, markets, etc. Okay, as we see stability here, we can push these down into clear and get into this idea of best practice. This is the way we do it. But if we, um, if we embrace um, best practice or rigid constraint too much, 
then the ability for the system to learn and change uh, is severely reduced. Okay, and then we have rigidity again if we go too deep or too detailed into our planning or into our, our management systems. And that leads us, and can everyone show that this is actually a cliff? We call it the cliff of complacency. As soon as the situation changes, or as soon as it's disrupted by a major event, earthquake, um, COVID-19 financial crisis, then we get kicked into chaos, and our ability to recover back to clear or even back up to complex is very, very difficult. Okay, so chaos, um, you may not get out of this. It's easy to slip into chaos if you're over constrained. It's actually very, very hard to move back out. And again, what I see, particularly in um, traditional consulting or risk management, is this idea that we start to have rules and procedures and processes for everything. Um, because firstly, it's easy to manage. Secondly, it's very easy to do a um, dashboard tick box exercise in terms of compliance, but it creates rigidity and it prevents people exploring. Now, there are times when we do need clear rules. Lockdown is one of them. Um, you know, uh, uh, making sure that we've got batteries in our smoke alarms might be another. Financial controls are another. Um, there are times when we need to allow experts to use their judgment. This is, um, again, when we're starting to develop processes and systems where we know we're here, we know we want to be here, and we know what we have to do, or at least we can plan through there. In this particular time where we're all at now, I would, I would say that we're going to need to spend a lot of time on this boundary exploring and experimenting and trying new things and seeing new ways of working and then as we start to see stability, then we move across. The system will be remain dynamic and fluid for a very long time. This idea of a new normal is folly. It's gonna be consistently and continuously changing. And if we start to be able to, to learn and experiment here, then we will find that once we get to the complicated, we will have far more resilient um, uh, plans and far more resilient uh, uh, businesses because we've tested them here. But it also means if we get another shock to the system, we can repurpose this mode of operation. So strategy moving through the next uh, period is more about how we move rather than what we do. What we do might change, what we do has to be fluid and adaptable, but our way of working uh, uh, should be rooted here for quite a long time. So we uh, at, at uh, Cornwall, we call this um, uh, detect, respond and then exploit. So through this period, we're detecting opportunities to try something new, opportunities to move forward in a different way, opportunities to repurpose products and services. We respond to those with small state to fail experiments, um, or sometimes we call them test and learn, uh, depending on the organization's ability, ability to tolerate the F word um, for failure. And then exploitation, um, in the sense that we are then co-creating value with um, our stakeholders, and this is exploiting the opportunity to create something new, not being exploitative. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop talking now um, and take some questions. I'll see there's a few, so I'll just go and grab, excuse the clunky. <laughs> How do you spell that, Kinevin? <laughs> Uh, that's easy, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. Um, I don't know what you can, I, I, I do it down the bottom. C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. Welsh word developed by a guy, Dave Snowden. Um, I'm an accredited Kinevan trainer, if it makes any difference to you guys. Um, but just don't think about it as a, um, as a, categor a categorical way of thinking about a situation, it's contextual. It's the important thing with Kinevin. So context will change as we act. So something that's complex now will change to complicated if I can build up some expertise and some knowledge in that system. Um, the merchants of certainty would have you bring this across really quickly or they would you know, kind of pretend to be experts in um, strategy, for instance. But I can tell you there are no experts in how we move forward out of COVID-19. Nobody has been in that situation. Okay, so beware of experts is a, is a way of thinking about um, 
context at the moment. A lot of organizations contextually are confused. So if you think about um, think big, act small, move fast is a way of actually moving out of a confused state and, and, and moving it to complex. Okay, we don't want to move out of confused and do something massive here in, in the clear domain and end up back in chaos. Another question, uh, uh, would you think that smaller organizations are in an advantage as against larger ones and moving and moving faster? Uh, larger ones typically have the risk of lapsing into older ways of doing things. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. Um, it's kind of a um, bit of a trope uh, that large organizations are um, rigid and that small organizations are adaptable. It's not necessarily true. Larger organizations have, um, uh, if we go back to the complex, they have the resources to try multiple um, perspectives, try multiple things. Whereas small organizations generally have one main product or service, um, they can try variations within that, but they oftentimes are very constrained. And I would suggest right now, small organizations are very, very constrained. I mean, they're just simply resource constrained, and most of you be in that. So, when we start thinking about moving, then we take a smaller steps if we're, if we're resource constrained. One of the things that holds large organizations back is firstly, um, uh, and I'm trying to be nice because, uh, you know, like a, a, a middle-aged man standing here telling you about this, is the stale male pale idea of people who were educated in the 90s like I was in the early 2000s have really only learned one way of managing and governing organizations, and that's the good old-fashioned destination path okay so if you only know one way of operating then oftentimes you will be constrained into the complicated and unable to work in the complex so shifting organizations from here to here I mean, it's fundamentally what we call we do that's our day job is to is to try and free them up but once they get that and they realize that they've actually got the resources and the uh, flexibility to do it then big organizations can perform exceptionally well here um, so it's not it's typically true, but I think larger organizations will actually start to have an advantage. Take that a step higher, and you say actually New Zealand has a competitive advantage globally, because firstly, we're far better connected. So everybody at the party kind of knows each other. So we can try and test and fail faster than the larger jurisdictions that are generally constrained by their shareholders and their short-term thinking to this mode of operation. So New Zealand's strategic competitive advantage is our ability to rapidly test and learn and then exploit. Traditionally, we haven't been particularly good at the exploit part. We generally sell out, um, but um, we do have the ability in New Zealand to test and move a lot, lot faster than they do, say, in North America or Europe. Okay. Um, <laughs> Large organizations in the midway of implementing a detailed strategy, should the strategy remain and take small strategic steps to get back on track or acknowledge now that the world and priorities have changed and scrap the strategy? I mean, obviously I'm tempted to say scrap the strategy. Um, I, I don't think uh, large detailed strategies have never been successful. I challenge anyone here to go back five years and pull out their strategy and say, this is where we're at. and and and. Uh, tell me about whether or not they've foreseen, and you know, take COVID-19 out of it, but whether or not they've foreseen all of the things that change along the way. Um, my view is have, if your strategy here has a good vision statement or future goal, then use it. If it's got a good current state analysis, which it almost certainly will, then use it. The merchants of certainty love this uh, current state analysis stuff, okay? And then rather than saying, how do we get from here to here, scrap that part of it and say, how do we move forward to maximize the evolutionary potential of our current state? And that question doesn't change. So we've got clients where we did strategy uh, three months ago, and I've drawn their strategy as opposed to written it, and the strategy is up on the wall as a picture, and they still use it. It hasn't changed due to COVID-19, because it's a strategy about movement. It's not a strategy about um, the path and the destination. So take the good bits out of this, the vision statement, the current state analysis, and then say, how do I move forward to maximize the evolutionary potential so my ability to um, allow for emergence from my current state? 
Okay, so don't scrap all the good work that you've done. That would be kind of silly. Um, what stage would you use this as an organization? Uh, sorry, at what stage would you use this as organizations are still in the thick of their response and parallel team working alongside response teams? Is there a parallel team working alongside response teams? Yeah. Um, again, I say go back to it. We need uh, financial stability, or at least not, not so much stability, but at least we need to know our financial position, get our finances under control so they don't grow. We need resilience. We need our leaders to understand that enabling action and managing the consequence of action is far more important than sticking to the plan or doing what we're told. Unbelievably, I've had a number of clients come to me in the last few days and say, one of the things that we've learned is that every, you know, I've instructed my leaders to talk to every member of their team one-on-one -on -one via Zoom every day. And I said, surely it doesn't take a lockdown for you to realize that that's a good idea. It's always been a good idea. The more interactions you have, the more you understand what's happening right now and the greater your ability to give people um, a way forward. Okay. Um, what, we, what we have with confusion is once we sort ourselves out, then we can move. Once we start moving, we start doing things differently. And one of the things that um, we see coming out of chaotic situations or extremely complex situations is this idea of acceptation, where we take things that we used to do or old things and exact them for new purposes. Every time we do that, um, uh, I would encourage you to make a note or record or share some of this stuff. And in a lot of organizations, if you've got the resources, you'll have a senior team managing uh, the strategy or the way forward. Get some of your new guys to go and follow the senior team virtually or in reality and just start recording everything that they're learning. And then you can use that when things stabilize, uh, uh, use that to create more efficient and effective ways of working. There is so much opportunity now to learn but if we get too quickly to rigid strategy, or if we get rigid strategy at all, we're going to lose that. Uh, it feels like this is equally applicable to the public sector. Do you have any examples of practice in government? Um, I've got lots of examples. I mean, maybe we could grab us offline for that. Um, I wrote the digital strategy for the Ministry of Health a couple of years ago using uh, the complex systems approach. Uh, Problem, or say problem, but one of the, I guess, issues with government agencies is they tend to, I mean, organisations in general are very risk averse. They generally come to here and then get too quickly to the, the clear. Um, and this gives us a false sense of security. So with government, um, they are very, very risk averse mostly. And this idea of, you know, not knowing what the future is going to be like or not being able to put a uh, econometric model across uh, uh, change over time is actually quite unsettling, um, particularly, uh, and I do bang heads with Treasury from time to time, apologies if there's anyone from Treasury on the, on the um, call, but Treasury loved this idea of where are we now, where do we want to be in the future, what does the financial model or, or situation look like? Uh, in my view, um, particularly in the, in the um, social um, good parts of government, then um, we need to take a more complex systems approach. Okay, we need to try and test and learn. And this concept of granularity means that in different uh, contexts, different people will experience things in, in a different way. So think about everybody at the party. Some people are having a great time. Some people are bloody miserable. Most people are in the middle. Where our, our systems, particularly in government, need to be able to accommodate those multiple perspectives. Yeah, so taking multiple perspectives is very hard for a government to do when they're implementing big blunt policies. Uh, but certainly applicable for government, so if anyone wants to give me a shout out about that, that's fine. Uh, what happens when the alert moves from 432 to 1? Is it wise for organisation to set a strategy on how business responds according to that? No. Um, again, if we think about when is the alert level going to move, then we're thinking about this idea of strategy or risk management as a predictive kind of science. So um, we're here, if the alert level suddenly drops, then we need to do this. If it suddenly rises, we need to do that. This idea of um, uh, we succeed or fail or move forward or don't based on the alert level is quite constraining because we don't have control over that. Well, rather what I would do is actually the alert levels are actually very clear. One, two, three, four. We know what they are, we can read them and we can understand what we need to do. So have a contingency 
in your strategy around what we would do if it moves around, but give people the freedom to try stuff, okay? Irrespective of the alert level. Because it might be that we go down to two for a few months, we get a spike in cases for some reason, and then we have to jump back to four, okay? Your strategy needs to be able to accommodate that. We don't know if that'll happen or when it'll happen, but what we know is it might happen, so let's give people the ability to be agile and responsive if that's the case. Luckily for us, we're at alert level four now, so most of us are well prepared and rehearsed for doing what we're doing. <laughs> I have noticed um, that every single big consulting firm is offering the miraculous solution for the business disruption that COVID-19 is causing each company firm. Do you think that organizations must ignore these offerings or should BCP based on internal strengths and experience? If not, how organizations or how can organizations select a good consulting firm uh, that can help during the part times? Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you now, uh, it's pretty hard to be objective. We're a small consulting firm and I generally uh, I compete very vigorously with the large consulting firms. So I'll just get that out of the way first. When I talk about um, a consulting equivalent of panic buying toilet paper, it is exactly that. I have seen a lot of consulting firms, let's rub this out, take the BCP off the shelf, um, dust it off, change some of the language, and then sell it into businesses as a way forward. Business continuity planning at its heart has two assumptions that I don't think are valid in this particular environment. Firstly, BCP assumes a, a local or regional disruption. Very seldom assumes a global disruption. Okay, so that makes this situation fundamentally more complex than a, a, a regional disruption, like say the Christchurch earthquake. It was very complex within Christchurch, but standing back and looking at it from a distance didn't seem as, as complex. And BCP meant if you could move out and then back in, that's okay, we can rebuild, we can um, repurpose assets. Right now, what we've got is a shift, not only in our um, structure, physical structure, physical way of working, we've got a shift in global markets that will probably ripple and, and back in across the pond in, in numerous times. So if you come up with a plan today that takes the shape today, tomorrow, then the next time the ripple comes across and disrupts the business, then it's broken. So it's going to break about every, I don't know, week at the moment, and then three months, and then six months. So for instance, there will be um, every, every large organization, every country, every jurisdiction in the world will be starting to challenge their concept or their um, supply chain in terms of its globalized, globalization. They'll be looking for supply chains for commodities, for access to resources, that can withstand a national lockdown. That's gonna fundamentally change the way uh, pricing mechanisms work, the way logistics and freight is, 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 it works, the way organizations think about risk uh, from a financial and non-financial perspective. And as organizations and countries respond to that, then it will change the, the way organizations and countries respond. Being a small country, New Zealand is generally gonna follow what happens overseas. So in that respect, if you've got a business continuity plan that has anchored some of these assumptions, then, then they have no right to be there. So the BCP model is broken. And what I'm seeing is people taking really old school, traditional management thinking, wrapping it in new language and then selling it into the market. What we need, if you're gonna move forward, don't move forward with the constraints of the past. Actually, this is the time to create the agile, resilient organization you've always wanted. Okay, so dusting off the old ways is not the way forward. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, Steve, my concerns relate to business levels of business acumen and ability to do as is required across cash cost customers. There is a great info from NZT and MB, uh, business associations to help. And thus, do you think that the risk on the future state is more a matter of insufficient collaboration or information and intelligence from trusted sources for business to then identify, analyze, and respond? Um, that's a big question. I think the crux of it is this, is when I talk about moving forward, then you move forward from your current condition with what you know at that time. If you've got access to information, 
if you've got access to uh, resources, then use use it. Right. Um, go back to COVID nineteen. If you can test the population and work out where the disease is, then use that information. Uh, if if you have access to market information or expertise or knowledge from NZT and E and MB, then use it and then make a more informed step at this point. Don't use it to make a better guess about what the future is going to be like. That'll shape up, but your, your question you should be asking right now is does this give me information to enable me to move forward? In the absence of information, take a smaller step and try more things. So um, your ability to detect uh, and respond to changing situation is directly linked to your ability to see it. So the only way to see it is to interact with it. And if, and if you can get resources that allow you to do that, then do it. So don't, you know, if you've got information or you've got um, knowledge or expertise, then, then this is the time to use it. So um, network more often, um, cast your net wider, talk to more people about more stuff would be, you know, kind of a real layman's way of saying that. Uh, have you worked in climate adaptation? No, not at all. Um, I'm not a, client sci a climate scientist, so if I want to know about that sort of stuff, I ask a climate scientist. I have worked in uh, a lot in renewable energy. Uh, I ran a marine um, a tidal uh, company in the UK, um, and we raised some funds for green energy and stuff, but no, sorry, not climate. Um, that looks like the end of questions, and it's coming up, goodness me, um, just on 10 past one. Um, so unless there's any other questions, I'm happy to throw it back to, um, to you guys at Risk New Zealand. And thank you very much, Steve. I mean, it's always a good sign when you run a little over time with the questions and it just shows a really good presentation. Thank you very much for that. I think everybody um, learned quite a bit um, today. Um, so thank you, Steve, once again, for taking us into your home for the presentation today. Much, <laughs> much appreciated. Beautiful. Um, just a shout out to our partners once again. Um, without them, this wouldn't be possible. Our premier partner, Marsh, our crisis management partner, F24, our lunchtime seminar partners, SAI Global and Safety Associates, our lunchtime seminar supporters, which are our venues across the country, KPMG, Watercare, Navigators, Christchurch City Council, and Powerco. Thank you all once again for making the time to join us at April's lunchtime seminar. Remember, if you have more questions, you can send them over to us at admin officer at risknz.org.nz. A recording of this webinar will be shared with you all soon. Uh, we will also be putting it up in the members area of the Risk New Zealand website. We intend to be back with more lunchtime seminars soon and look forward to welcoming you to more of these risk NZ activities in the near future. Till then, take care. Kia kaha.